Good evening. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls. So welcome to Monday evening. I hope you've had a good day so far. Uh, have you got out in that sunshine? It's been glorious where I am. I've really enjoyed the, uh, the warmth, feeling the warmth of the sun, getting some vitamin D and having a walk with my children, playing in the garden. It's been lovely today. So I hope you've managed to get out as well. And um, tonight we have got a special guest in the studio. Studio! Simon Carrigan, who is an artist, and um, he's going to talk to us about his mental health journey and how he uses creativity in various forms to assist him in his recovery from mental health issues and addiction issues. So if you have any questions um, for Simon or for myself or just general comments, then do submit your comments. If you go to that link there beforehand, we will be able to see your name, so we'll know who it is that's commenting. You don't have to if you don't want to, but uh, otherwise just submit your comments and questions and we'll see if we can uh, address those as we go through. Okay, so just before we kick off, um, the other news is uh, Mental Health First Aid England will now allow us, us Mental Health First Aid instructors, to deliver the half day mental health first aid aware course online. So I'm going to be doing my first one online using Zoom um, pretty soon. Uh, so if you're interested, register your interest. So send me a, an email or send me a message or just comment on here. And um, once I've got enough people together, we will go ahead and set a date for it. I might just set a date anyhow. anyway, actually. But just let me know if you're interested. It's a really good course. It's a kind of starter course to give you more information about mental health and how you can spot the signs of mental health issues in others, how you can manage your own mental health. Uh, really important during this crisis and beyond. So give me a shout if you're interested in that and uh, we will get Simon into the studio. So, Simon Carrigan, hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Hiya, yeah, nice to be here, thank you. So, how are you feeling today? Um, I've had quite a nice day today. I've had my kids with me. We've just had some fun, had some giggles. Good stuff, yeah, great. So, I, I believe you, you've had an injury recently to your leg. Yeah, um, broke my leg about six weeks ago now. It happened at my um, kid's birthday party. So, yeah, we're, we're just, I'm recovering from that. Luckily, my kids weren't too traumatised by it, so that were okay. <laughs> mm, yeah, one challenge after another. So we're kind of going to be talking about your, your mental health journey. Um, so I know you've had uh, mental health issues, addiction issues, which... I presume you would you say that they're kind of tied in with each other? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, do you want to just kind of go ahead and, and tell us, uh, first of all, what you do now from a creative perspective? And then maybe we'll, we'll go back and, and trace your history as to what got you here today and the challenges you've been through. Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, um, Basically, I'm an artist. I do poetry and music as well as painting. Um, my painting, because I wasn't a brilliant traditional artist, I started basing it around cartoons and graffiti. Um, and that's how I got a lot of my experience as an artist. And from there, I've built on it, realised it weren't really talent I was lacking, it was just experience. Mm -hmm. So the more that I do, the better I get at everything creatively. And um, I use it really to keep my mind focused, to keep occupied and to stop my mind from wandering when I'm having a lot of unwanted thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would you say that you, when you're using your creativity, is it a form of expression around your mental health and addiction issues or is it totally separate from that a bit of both really so i do think if i've got something that i'm turning over a lot in my mind i will try and focus on it maybe with poetry or with a painting 
and that'll sometimes help me sort of unfold it and work out my problems myself um quite a few times as well like i used to be addicted to a lot of substances and one thing i do is i write down my thoughts on paper of the reasons why i gave up and i can keep looking back at them and i can keep introducing them into new artworks and that reinforces the belief really of why i gave things up because i find even on a, even on a good day i can think back to drugs and i can think back to I know that a lot of it is my mind sugarcoating things, but I mean, I did have some good times on drugs. So I've got to remind myself of the 99% of the times when it wasn't good because my mind only really wants to hold on to that 1% of the time when it was good for me. Mm. So I use a lot of poetry to reinforce the reasons why I gave things up. And that is mainly the love of my children, the love of my family, and not wanting people, not, I, I, I don't like letting people down. And I feel like um, when I was a drug user, that was pretty much all I was doing was letting my family down. Mm. So I definitely use me art really as sort of a little slap in the face of a reminder of keep yourself going on this path now because it's a lot better than the path that I was on. Mm -hmm. so a kind of constant reminder and i suppose it's a bit like going to the gym if you keep going there you get the muscle stronger you build that resilience and that message uh the more yeah. the stronger it gets and, and you're kind of using poetry and your other forms of art to remind yourself this is this is the path and yeah i need to stay on this path to, for, for the things that matter to you like your children and, and your health and well-being definitely i mean down to the drug addiction. I wrote a book on poetry and I perform doing spoken word with these poems. And I'd find now what I find so strong about the effect that book has on me is that I'd feel a, a massive hypocrite now if I went back on drugs and yet was still doing public speaking on anti drugs. So, really, I just want to be able to believe in everything that I'm saying so that that keeps me clean now mm. because I, I've had more opportunities on speaking on keeping clean than I ever had while I was on drugs mm. I mean you're not the only opportunities you ever get you throw them away really because you haven't got time for them mm. yeah because the pull of the drugs is so strong for that one percent of the time that you say that it is worth it it is fun that yeah pulls you back in doesn't it and you can't see yeah. the, the trees maybe and I think our mind's very good at keeping all to that 1% fun time and um, throw away that 99% of the dark days because you don't want to remember them. But like I say, I've got to keep reminding myself, like 99 days out of 100, it was terrible being a drug user. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it weren't just terrible on me and my health. It was terrible on everyone around me. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. Um, so can you... Can you perhaps give us a bit of background, Simon, around um, how, your, how you see that your mental health and addiction problem started, whether it was back in childhood or something particular that happened as you were growing up? I mean, I do think it all stemmed from, as a child, having ADHD and it not really being focused on it all. Um, my doctor in, in the 80s, the way that he tried to do it was, he thought if we focused on it, I'd get worse. So his thing was to try and focus on maybe my diet and make sure that I didn't have a high sugar intake and things like that and keep me occupied with sports. So I did a lot of swimming when I was younger. But when i went from primary school to secondary school it all of a sudden i weren't the strongest swimmer in the school i was one of the weakest because i was starting again at the youngest part of the school and uh, it took a big knock on my confidence and i think i think that's when i started hitting drugs the the hardest was it i was young i was 11 or 12 and 
it was to deal with the fact that I, I didn't have the outlet of sports anymore because I gave it up because I weren't confident because, like I say, I was all of a sudden I was one of the smallest children in the school. Mm. Whereas when I was 10 and I was swimming in junior school, I, I was the fastest swimmer in school. So it made a big difference for me. Yeah. So and also, I, I noticed like I, I was always hiding that I liked to read and things like that because the kids that I hung about with liked football and liked other things. They didn't, they thought I was a nerd for things like that. So I think a lot of the times I was just hiding my true self mm. by taking drugs and it started with cannabis and it just led on from there, really. Mm. So that feeling of maybe separateness that you felt yeah. different to, to your peers, maybe was there some bullying going on or anything like that? Or was it just a case yeah. of... Definitely. And um, rather than try and deal with it with teachers, I always wanted to deal with it by fighting. So I, I was sort of, my peers brought me up to believe that you don't grasp no matter what. Mm -hmm. It was it was a big term, the term grass. So I wasn't, you weren't allowed to tell people about what was happening. Whereas when I look back now, it's just... Um, it's a very good tool of somebody controlling you, making you believe that just by opening up and telling your story that you're doing something that's snaky maybe or something that's that's not right. Mm -hmm. So now I, I see that and with my children, the, the first thing I tell them with everything is let's talk about things first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking about stuff is uh, so important, isn't it? Um, yeah, we had um, Mike Richard on at the weekends talking about peer support groups for mental health and just yeah. that talking is is so important because otherwise we're pushing stuff down and we're uh, getting into stuff like um, peer pressure, drugs, yeah. lots of unhelpful behaviours um, and like you say, it's more about you had to hide your true self, which must have been quite painful, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was sort of like, um, like going back to your analogy, it's like you're always putting a lid on the bottle and keeping your true self inside this bottle. Mm. But that lid, the more you keep stuffing stuff in the bottle, that lid has to get bigger and bigger to keep mm. everything in. Mm. So with me, it was pretending that I was something I wasn't, which was really trying to be like a cool street kid rather than being a little nerd, which, I mean, when I look back, I should have been proud of being a geek. It's not wrong with it. Mm. But back then, I was definitely, I thought, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to hang about outside with all the lads and that. I wanted to be part of a gang. And, and when you're a kid, like, the term gang isn't a bad term. You sort of see it as just a a bigger collection of support mm -hmm. you don't realize really that it's just a a load of kids with problems banded together mm -hmm. and 20 kids with 20 problems each is that's a lot of problems in the room mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, i mean we're social creatures aren't we we want to belong we want to have a tribe uh, and yeah you, you fell in with, with that tribe and like you say started using cannabis moved on to other drugs and then is it right in your 20s that things got, uh, kind of took a, a serious turn? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'm in mid 20s, really. Um, all of a sudden, I was starting to take time off work because of my hangovers and things like that. It was, um, yeah, and it snowballed quickly after that to the point where people were noticing. Up and I mean, I, I'd, I'd hidden my drug use from my family for. 15 years nearly um but all of a sudden I, I couldn't i couldn't hide it anymore i'd got that much of a problem that my whole world were crashing down so what did that look like it was kind of a, a mental breakdown in your 20s it looked like a very angry man mm. who wasn't admitting that he had a problem was blaming everybody else around him so like I say, a lot of it come out in anger and in me thinking it was the world that had the problem, not me. 
and yeah, I was I was in denial for for quite a few months until until I lost my job, I, I lost my partner, and I was on the edge of losing my home as well. Um, and yeah, that was it. Then I I told my parents, I sold my house and I moved in with my mum and dad. And I'm, I know it was hard for my parents, but I'm so grateful. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, they saved my life. Mm -hmm. So at, at your lowest point, would you like to describe what, what it was like from a kind of mental health perspective for you? Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was self-harming regularly. I was, I've had five or six attempts to suicide um, from stepping out into traffic to overdoses. I mean, I think, I think the worst point was screaming at my parents, telling them that it's the world's fault, not mine. And yeah, I mean, looking back, there were some pretty shameful moments. Um, but I didn't see them as shameful at the time because I were, this was before we had kids and I was still thinking the world revolved around me. Mm. So, like I say, I was blaming the whole world. I was blaming capitalism. I was blaming the 40-hour working week rather than just swallowing my pride and admitting that I'd messed up. Mm -hmm. So are you able to, to look back on those times now with some self-compassion and forgiveness for yourself or, or is there still feelings of shame and regret there? Well, a, a little bit of both. Like, um, I think... I think the shame never really goes away, but it just, the more you talk about it, it, it just becomes easier to talk about, really. Mm. Um, and I sort of feel like if I can tell somebody my story and it stops them going all the way down into the abyss, then it's well worth doing. Absolutely. So, so what was it that, uh, allowed you to turn the corner, Simon? What, was there a moment or some, some events that led to you starting your recovery and getting into creativity? Well, it was um, definitely talking to a therapist and doing some cognitive behaviour therapy um, just to sort of open my eyes and sort of make me realise that all my previous held beliefs were all like, I'd reinforced them out of nothing. And I could, it was okay to start again and throw away everything I'd believed about the world and just look at it from a fresh pair of eyes. So the biggest thing I found was that it's all right to be creative. It isn't, it's not a childish thing to do. I mean, we all can be creative on some level, whether it's just writing a couple of words down or baking, I mean, cooking. There's, there's a thousand different ways of being creative, I think. And I think not every single one of them has to lead down to, for example, a career or something that you can make money out of. If you can just enjoy yourself and it helps you focus on just that one thing rather than the 20 things that's bothering you at that moment, and I think it's a very powerful tool for that. Mm. So, for example, if I'm playing a song on the guitar, I've got to think of the song I'm playing. If I try and think of every other song that that band has ever made, I'll never get through the song. So I focus on the one song, on the lyrics, on the music, and I go through it. And by that way, I've found on mindfulness becomes easy. It's not something I'm fighting against. Whereas at first, when the first time I read about mindfulness, it seemed to me like it was throw away everything out of your mind and focus on nothing. And I can't, I mean, I strongly believe that your mind has to have one thing in it, maybe. You can't get, get rid of everything, otherwise, you haven't got a mind anymore. But you can focus on one thing and focus on just that. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for 
shutting down all of like, sort of like monkey voices in my mind. I think creativity is amazing for that. Mm. So, so would you say that when you are um, doing your poetry or your music or your other forms of art, are you able to just concentrate on that thing for the period of time that you, you're doing it for and, and the monkey voices are quiet or, or how does it work? Yeah, definitely. And, and at first I found it quite hard, but just my first aim was two minutes at a time to do two minutes of drawing, mm -hmm. think of nothing else but the pencil and paper. And you can soon build that up to five, 10, 20 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really believe it doesn't matter what, how big a step you make, even if they're only tiny steps, but they're forward. Again, yeah, it's not about making big leaps and bounds with your creativity and with art. It's about just a little step at a time. And I found from building up, from trying to do two minutes, maybe two minutes a day to doing 20 minutes every couple of hours. Mm -hmm. And it really came part of my, my routine and my schedule to a point where I miss it now. If, if I don't, if I'm not being creative in the day, it's almost as if I haven't put socks on. I don't feel right. Mm. And it it keeps me going amazingly. Mm. I've, I've cut down on my medication in the last couple of years now. Um, and I'd say a lot of that is to do with just keeping creative yeah. and not just having that one outlet. So I'm not just painting. I'm not just doing music and I'm not just doing poems. I can... I can pick anything up depending on what my mood is because we all feel different every day. And um, I, I couldn't just eat one meal every day forever. So I find I'll just pick up whatever whatever I'm feeling the mood for that day and have a go at it. If I don't make anything, well, that's fine. I can throw it away and I can have a go again tomorrow. At least I've took my time up doing that rather than pondering on bad thoughts. Yeah. So it's a form of focus, a kind of form of mindfulness, form of safe expression, and a way yeah. of uh, quietening those voices in your head. So it's it's almost it's like my mental health exercise every day, really. Yeah, that's a nice way of looking at it. So, did you find Simon when you first started expressing yourself creatively? Was there some kind of self judgment within yourself that you thought, "Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not an artist." I can't do this or not? Yeah. yeah. Um, even to the point of if I got like a new sketchbook and I'd see that there was a hundred white pages and I'd think, oh, I'm not good enough to mark on this book because look at how beautiful and clean it is. And what if I just mess it up? But I, I can't remember who told me, but someone said, you know, that sketchbooks are made to drawing. Like, the person who invented the sketchbook didn't want an empty sketchbook sat on your shelf. He wanted you to mess it up. Mm. Or she wanted you to mess it up. So, like, if I wasn't making a mark on every single one of those pages, I was being disrespectful to every artist and creator before me. Mm. So, yeah, like, it was definitely hard at first to not be so judgmental of my work. And my first few paintings, I wanted it to be as low and stuff like that. And I mean, it's just for for nine hundred ninety nine thousand people, it's, it's never going to happen. That sort of talent, but you can always aim at something, and you don't have to do a full Michelangelo painting. But I remember one time I copied just a, a thumb and tried to get the thumbnail right off of Michelangelo painting. And I felt like I'd cracked it. It, it looked amazing. So I'd done my little Michelangelo then. Mm. It, it doesn't matter what size your goal is. If, if you set yourself a goal and you get to it, it's a good feeling. Mm. That's lovely. Yeah, I like the fact that you just concentrated on one small part rather than thinking, I've got to be this expert who can do this wonderful, huge thing. Yeah. I've got the rest of my life to do the rest of the painting. Yeah, that's a lovely way of looking at it, Simon. So would you say that 
through expressing your creativity, it's had an impact on your self-esteem and your confidence? Ooh. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I was amazed at how many people are appreciative of art. So mm. it doesn't matter at what level I was, whatever work I was showing to people, there was, there was either <laughs> commenting really nice, like giving me credit and praise, or there was giving me good criticism on how to improve. Mm. And I mean, to be honest, the criticism on how to improve was much more valuable than the praise mm. because that is how I have become a much better artist is by listening to what people said. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, it's a really good feeling for people to see what you've created and they like it. And it, it makes you stand a little bit taller and makes you realise, like, you, you shouldn't have as much doubt in yourself because if nobody else sees that doubt, maybe it shouldn't be there. Mm. Yeah, so even if no one else looks at the work or no one else provides any feedback on the work, do you, do you, are you able to stand back from what you produced, and uh, whether it's a song or a poem or a piece of art, and actually just feel good about yourself from what you've achieved? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, with the poetry... With me, it always um, comes down to if if I can picture the story I'm talking about as I'm reading it, then I think I've I've cracked it myself. Then, um, so I can I can feel really proud out of words more than I can out of art, really, because I think we're very much more subjective over words, so I can judge it myself a lot easier. Whereas art, it's, um, it's to taste, isn't it? Mm. And I mean, I've done some paintings before that I've hated and yet I've still sold them. And then I've, I've got a painting up in the loft, like a, an Elvis Presley painting I've done, that I've never sold. And I think it's amazing. But everybody else looks at it and I think it's just a little bit too left field. It's a bit... The, the way I did it was a little bit Picasso style and... Yeah, I think people just looked at it as I'd, I'd done a dead blocky looking Elvis. And, um... <laughs> well, like you say, art is subjective. I suppose all forms of art, poetry, music, everything, it's subjective. Yeah. But I suppose the main thing is if, if you're getting some benefit from it and um, you're enjoying it, you're expressing your creativity, it's boosting your self-esteem, it's keeping your mental health on track, that's the main thing I would suggest. And then if other people enjoy it as well, maybe that's the bonus. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because, I mean, that's what I was using drugs for was to keep my mind occupied. Mm. Um, creativity is much better at doing that because it it does the same job, but it doesn't leave you with an hangover. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, very good. Okay, so... Um, I wonder if you could explain uh, just a couple more questions. Um, with this current coronavirus crisis, you know, there's a lot of restrictions on people. There's also a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear around what's going on, how long is it going to last, are we going to get affected by it, can't go out and do the things that we are normally just take for granted. And yourself, I wonder how you're being affected by it and added into that the fact that you're not fully mobile because of your leg at the minute. How is that affecting your mental health, would you say, Simon? So there was a um, couple of points on that. So I, I came out of hospital straight into isolation, which for the first couple of days, to be honest, I was, I was, um, I was frustrated. But I also realised that everybody else was in the same position as me. So... Um, it sort of it made me feel a little bit less like I was stuck on my own with my broken leg, because everybody's stuck at home, aren't they now? So um, yeah, I sort of, in a funny way, I feel a little bit more connected to everybody now we're isolated, mm. because we're all doing it, we're all in it together. Whereas before we were all off on our own little jollies. Mm. Yeah, it's a great um, level, isn't it? It's. Uh... And the equal opportunities virus and equal opportunities restrictions. So we're all in the same boat. Definitely. Um, 
Yeah, definitely a great leveller. And um, it, it's been very good for me looking on Facebook and realising I, I could delete some negative people and it didn't really matter. It, it, if, if anything, it's, it's made me feel more positive by not reading as many negative posts. Mm. Um, so, yeah, without, without guilt, I deleted a few negative friends and I've kept in touch with them off Facebook. But I've said I've I've said to him, look at just I was having a big clean up of my Facebook and anybody that wasn't either positive ninety percent of the time or trying to put a positive spin on things when they could, then I just I, I didn't need I didn't need them in my news feed. Mm. So that's what I've done. And um yeah, my, my Facebook now I go on and I feel positive mm. when I'm reading it. That's great because you know if, if you're anything like me, you'll be on Facebook every day, and what we yeah. see there kind of strengthens whatever mood we've got at the moment. I think, and if we're feeling positive, certainly for me, if I'm feeling positive, I see more positive stuff. I'm feeling more positive. If I'm feeling pretty down for for some reason, and I see some negativity on Facebook or on the news or whatever it, the media is, yeah, it feel worse. So, so that kind of curating of your own news and social media can be really helpful a really positive tip i think yeah because you, i mean you've got to realize you we're filtering the whole world through our smartphone you're filtering everything before it gets to you you're filtering it through this little phone and it's going through a couple of people's opinions before it gets to you mm -hmm. um so you've just got to remind yourself of that sometimes and mm -hmm. not to take every piece of word as verbatim and not to think you've got to keep in touch with everybody just because you knew them once at school and things like that. Yeah, I suppose it's a, a boundary issue, Simon, around actually I know what's good for me, I know what's good for my mental health and well-being, and if this person or this particular news story is not going to help, I'm not going to let it in. Yeah, yeah, and... And then on a day when you are feeling stronger, why not go for it and have a look at them stories again? But but definitely, I, I try to bear in mind, if I'm not having a great day mentally, I, I, I won't watch the news all day and things like that because I'll just be looking for the worst in each thing. Mm. Um, I mean, one thing the media is not great at is positive spins on stuff because it doesn't really sell. Mm. Um, it's not news like bad news, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got actually a, a research journalist coming in in about a week's time who's going to talk about that and how we can do the news better in this kind of right. journalism and bad news crisis and without actually following it up like a, a, a flowing story. We just get the, yes, yeah. it's a bad thing that's happened. Here's another bad thing that's happened. And then it kind of... Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just, it, it creates, it, it's like a little half hour panic attack every time you turn on the news really yeah. but it it it's how we're um it's it's how we've made the news for a long time it's for yourselves don't it and fear is also very interesting to us as humans mm. so you can see why we still got that curiosity of wanting to turn on the news even if you're having a bad day yeah that's a good point Okay, so some useful positive tips there of what people can do to look after their mental health during this crisis, crisis and beyond, I would say. So, um, yeah, before we end, is there, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Anything that you think might be helpful from your personal experience, your journey of mental health issues and addiction that might be helpful to others who are perhaps struggling themselves? What I'd say is... Um... The easiest way to get rid of an addiction and to get rid of all addictions completely is to replace it with something else. And I replaced my terrible drug addiction with an addiction for art and creativity. Um, addictions don't have to be a bad thing. You can pick something healthy and get addicted to that. And that's, I would say, if you want to succeed at getting off a bad addiction, swap it for a good one. Don't just try and get rid of all addiction. Mm. Yeah, really good tip. And um, have you heard of Dr. Gabor Mate at all, Simon? No, I haven't, no. 
Uh, I like him a lot. He's a, an addiction and trauma expert. And one right. of the little sound bites is um, addiction is the opposite of connection. So uh, oh, yeah. all addictions have some kind of uh, root and a lack of connection. So it seems to me yeah. that what you've done is get connected with your creativity and you're using that to keep yourself occupied and you, you kind of name it as an addiction yourself, but it's a really positive thing to be doing, isn't it? Yeah. And not only that, it the people that I'm surrounded with in the art world, much more positive than the people I was surrounded with in the drug world. Yes. Much nicer people to be around. Mm. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a much easier life to live. Yeah. I didn't realise how much of an hard life I'd put myself in. I thought drugs was the easy option out of life. But no, it was the opposite. It, it, it was really hard work and it, it took a massive toll on my health, mentally and physically. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah if, if, all, if one thing I can say is it's, it's not that helpful door that you think it's going to lead to a fantasy land of fun and happiness. It's not giggles at all. Mm. It's a world of pain. Yeah, yeah. And um, you're only putting off your pain until you're sober again. You're not actually dealing with it. Yeah, very good point. Yeah. Well, I, for one, am very pleased that you have got through it, Simon, and you've, uh, you've shared your story with us today. And I find it really inspiring how you've really embraced different forms of creativity. You haven't just chosen one. You've chosen at least yeah. one. And you, you're doing what you feel like, and it's keeping your head above water, keeping the voices quiet, and uh, really lovely to hear all those wonderful things that creativity does for you. So, yeah, that's of course. And thank you for sharing. Thank you. So, so before you go, do you want to let people know where they can uh, get in touch with you, where they can find your work or connect with you in some way? Yeah. Um, if they want to look at my poetry, if you look up Doll Boy, that's Boy, B-O-Y, a um, little bit of play on the word from the name Del Boy, and also... Doll and Gyro used to be right up my street, so that's where all my poetry is. And my graffiti art is under the name Daddy S. That's E S S. Okay, I shall put that on the screen now. There we go. Okay, so Dollboy and Daddy S. Uh, so that's yeah. Facebook and that's other social media as well. Yeah, it's mainly just on Facebook now. I um, I. I do have Instagram and stuff, but I tend to just focus on Facebook at the minute. Okay, great stuff. Well, Simon, thank you very much for your time and for sharing your story with us, which I hope will be interesting and really useful to others who may find themselves going through some similar challenges to the ones that you have successfully navigated. So thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Do you take care of yourself, Simon? Thanks again for coming in. Thanks very much. All right. See you. Bye. Lovely. What a fine gentleman and what an inspiring example of what we can do to recover from mental health and addiction issues using creativity in its various forms. As Simon says, it, isn't, it doesn't just have to be one, one thing that you do. You can choose whatever brings you joy, whatever allows you to express yourself. So that was great. I enjoyed that. And um, yeah, before I go, let's just remind you, if you wouldn't mind, Keep sharing the group. Let's get this message out to as many people as possible. Let's support as many folk as we can through this crisis and hopefully beyond. If we can keep this going beyond that, it would be great. And um, another reminder again, <coughs> excuse me, half day mental health aware courses, official mental health first aid England courses. I'm going to be offering these very soon. Uh, we've got the go ahead to be able to do this via Zoom. So if you're interested in learning more about mental health issues, how to spot them in others, how to look after your own well-being, um, it's a kind of a really good starter, this half-day course. Uh, so give me a message, comment, send an email to info at pathlight.org.uk, get in touch with me however you, however you wish, and I'll make a list of names and we'll set a date and we'll get it, uh, get it rolling. Look forward to doing that. It's a great course. 
So, um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, folks. Tomorrow we have got, um, I think in the morning, I'll probably do a meditation and uh, run through one, uh, one of the other sections of the Successfully Navigating Homeworking resource, which you can download for free from the resources section of this group. Um, yeah, I'll probably do section one. It's a good place to start. And that's all about setting up your day to maximise productivity and make sure you're in the right space to uh, get what you need to get done during the day. Whilst you're home working and possibly homeschooling some children as well. And then 6pm tomorrow we have Man Tuesday, which is a, a men's talking group. If you are male, you are very welcome to come along. And uh, that's on Zoom. If you want further details on that, just check out uh, Man Tuesday Saddleworth on Facebook. The link's on there and you'll be very welcome to join us. It's just some men being themselves, talking, listening, expressing feelings, talking about relationship issues, how they're navigating the, the current crisis and whatever else comes up. So uh, hopefully see some of you guys there tomorrow, 6 p.m. and possibly for a little session tomorrow morning here on The Hive as well. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for being with us and we'll see you soon. Toodaloo.